All right. Well, thanks everybody for sticking with us here on Channel One with Cisco Connect for our second session of the day. We have Paul Vergara. He's a consulting systems engineer out of Phoenix, Arizona, and he's going to be really walking us through um, the SASE uh, portfolio that uh, that Jonathan mentioned. And this session is called Capture the Cloud Transition with SASE. So, Paul, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. and you have landed in realizing that this isn't where you're supposed to be, please uh, dial into the other channel. And so, so with that, um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. And this is the overall agenda that I have for you for the next 45 minutes. First, we're going to unpack really what SASE is. We're going to learn about some of the challenges that it addresses and take a closer look at the overall solutions. Um, we're going to have some demos as well. Uh, we'll show you how this cloud native security can protect users. And we're going to see that from the actual user experience. I think that's important so that we can understand and, and talk a little bit about why those security controls are so important. And then we're going to move on to more of kind of the administrator perspective where we take a look at how we manage this infrastructure and specifically how routers can be provisioned automatically. And, and in that process, you can create tunnels automatically to the Cisco SASE cloud. And, and all of that is gonna be, like I said, in an automated and <clears throat> automated way. So about half the time is gonna be presentation, about half the time will be demo. But let me start by first saying that SASE isn't any individual product. And you may not be a SASE expert, but you might know at least that there's some aspects of enterprise networking in there. We're talking VPNs or, or WAN, basically the transport, but we're also taking into consideration the critical security functions um, and also uh, some of the identity that goes with that. But being as this is a security session, we're gonna be focused primarily on the latter of the two. Uh, and I'll touch on you know some of the networking aspects as, as we go along. So you might be wondering why we're discussing any of this at all when, you know, none of this technology is, is really new. And, and to some degree, you'd be right because, you know, VPNs, we've been using those for years. That's not new. WANs aren't new either. And I've been supporting security solutions for close to 20 years now. So that certainly isn't new. So in preparing for this presentation, I had to even ask myself, well, why are we talking about this like it's new? And the conclusion that I came to is, is what you see on this screen. It's the way that we work and how that we do it that's what's massively transformed. I mean, even in the last five to 10 years, when you look at this slide, this is how networks actually used to be. They, some are, they're still like this, but it's, it's, uh, it's evolving. It was very much hub and spoke. Our applications lived on-prem in our private data centers. And you pretty much had to be on the corporate network if you wanted to have any level of access or get any work done. If you were in a branch office, your traffic was backhauled back to the data center so that you can get access to those applications and data that you need. If you wanted internet access, it egressed from there. And so it only made sense that we would put our entire security stack there. So the, our, our firewalls, which acted as our the protection and, and the perimeter, as they say, that was there along with our IDS, IPS, our email and web gateways, they all live there. And, and it just made sense that's where the inspection took place. But you fast forward to today, and, and I would wager that on this call, if we were to uh, pull where people are actually dialed in from, what we would see is that many, if not the majority of us, aren't even in our corporate offices. We're in our home offices due to the ongoing pandemic, as you can imagine. And so that's going to introduce a, a level of risk. And, and we're all connecting now, continually checking email and messaging on, on devices just like this. So that's also going to introduce risk. I mean... When we expose our critical applications and data from devices that might not be corporate owned or even corporate managed. So on that note, while we're talking about applications, I mean, those are seemingly just as mobile as we are. We've adopted cloud infrastructure, SaaS based applications that has all massively changed the way that traffic flows. And we we can't rely on this traffic to even get to our on premise data center where the inspection lives. You know, there's a quote by. Gartner, and I'm going to slaughter this probably, but I'll paraphrase that, that. And they say that the legacy data center 
as, as the center of the universe and basically the network stack and the network architecture that goes with that, it's becoming obsolete. And so it's become a real hindrance to the needs of digital business and it's becoming an inhibitor. Um, so I think there's some truth to that. I mean, even when I look at how I work, right, and the discussions that I have with some of you on a day-to-day -day basis, I find some truth to that. The traffic is seemingly coming from many places. The destinations have all changed. And so this is, at its core, what SASE aims to address. And it needs to do so in a way that doesn't impact the user experience, doesn't change performance, doesn't get more clunky, uh, as they would say. And it has to do it in a way that makes life for us security practitioners and network operators. It's got to make our lives easier. It's got to be easy to maintain. Uh, that transport has got to be simpler, got to take the complexity out of it, all while still maintaining a certain level of security. And so back to that Gartner quote, um, if we think about what the new model needs to be, it's one where the center of the universe is really going to shift to the cloud and to the Internet. And basically, this is what SASE aims to address. When you distill it down, that's what we're here to talk about. It's, it's talk about how these changes are forcing us to rethink network connectivity and how we secure users, our devices, and the information that goes over all of that transport. Okay, this is our overall Cisco SASE vision. I'm obviously not going to be able to talk about all this. You're probably wondering, we're gonna really get through this in 45 minutes. No, we are not <laughs> because we wouldn't do any of it justice and, and we'd really be racing through it. So instead I'm gonna be focusing on what you see in these two boxes right here for SASE and also Zero Trust. Um, we're gonna take our time with unpacking these components. So at least you leave understanding the, the, the components that are, are within this box, because these are really the core components that are needed uh, for this dynamic workforce that we pretty much have today. And, and so then we won't be talking about solutions like Tetration that you see down here. Um, you know, that's basically what we use to secure workloads, regardless of where they're actually hosted, whether that is on-prem or in the cloud, or if they live on bare metal VMs or containers, you know, Tetration could secure all of that. We also have things like StealthWatch Cloud uh, for better insights and network behavior. Uh, so just so you know, I wanted to show this so you can see that, you know, there's more to this architecture. So please reach out to your local security TSA if you want to learn more. And um, just a reminder, there is a Q&A panel. So if you have questions about anything that I've said thus far, feel free to just drop it in the Q&A. And we have a, a group of panelists that are, are ready to address questions as they come. Okay, have a look at this. This is what Gartner defines SASE as. And um, by the way, SASE is actually their term. And you may have heard this referred to by other names, namely Zero Trust Edge or the Elastic Cloud Gateway. If you've heard any of those terms, we're really talking about uh, the same thing. So regardless of the name, what you should take away is that it's basically a multi-function platform that is delivered from the cloud. So on the one hand, as you can see here on the slide, you have the networking as a service, very network centric solutions. And then on the right side, where we'll be focusing much of our time, you have the security solutions that are delivered from the cloud. Uh, when we break these down, at least in our view, they really fit into these primary categories of connectivity, security, and identity. Um, we've spent a, a lot of time and work making sure that our solutions across our security portfolio are deeply integrated and they operate in a way that they can share information. Or if one uh, solution uh, is able to see a threat, we share that information in a way that it can modify policy on another solution because there's no point in letting it um, continue or be pervasive across the network. So uh, Along the way, you'll have deep visibility of all of this. And so you get that integration and the modification of policy. That's, these are just key tenants overall. Let me dive into each one of these individually for you. Okay, so on here, I think it goes without saying here at Cisco, this is you know connecting people devices. It's kind of our wheelhouse. We've developed really robust offers around each one of these items that you see here. In today's session for SD-WAN, we're gonna talk more about Viptela, but just keep in mind, we have Meraki as well for remote access. It probably comes as no surprise that, you know, as widely adopted as any Connect is, that that's our remote access tool. And I'll stamp an asterisk on that too, because, you know, it's so much more 
than just a remote access tool. And we also have um, proxy-based solutions, not only for outbound and protecting outbound web access, but uh, you might not know we have inbound too. So we, we can expose web applications to you know, our users as needed. And we do these with you know, our solutions like Umbrella and Duo. As you can see here, this is where we're gonna spend the bulk of our time today. Umbrella is that multi-function platform. And starting with um, DNS layer security. I mean, that, that's how pretty much everybody knows Umbrella, you know, formerly known as OpenDNS. Uh, and there's uh, a reason for that that's pretty much where it started. But we've since introduced a lot more features into Umbrella. We now have a cloud-delivered firewall that not only um, is, acts like a stateful firewall, but it has layer seven application visibility and control. Uh, there's also a secure web gateway with all the benefits of a full proxy. So just keep that in mind too. Between those three things, the DNS, the cloud delivery firewall and the secure web gateway, these are really the core features. And that's what we're gonna talk about in detail, but just to round it out, we also have CASB, which is a cloud access security broker technology, uh, deeply embedded too. And that basically protects you uh, from having sensitive or confidential information uh, transit or exit the environment. Um, we do have DAT capabilities that are in development. It's only going to get better. Uh, but suffice it to say, I should probably mention that you know, DLP has long existed in some of our other solutions, like our email security and even in our cloud lock solution. So uh, we're going to be improving that. And probably one of the latest enhancements that we're bringing to the table is this remote browser isolation, which basically functions as a way of um, protecting your users and devices from opening websites that, that could be harmful because what it does is it opens it in a completely separate environment away from the actual device. So think of it in, in, in much of the way like a, like a thin client operates, whether it's Citrix or, or RDP. If you were to log into a, a different machine completely and open a page there, there's very little to low risk for your local machine. You can pretty much eliminate that. So that's what that stands to do. Um, there's also uh, the malware detection and blocking, uh, you'll hear me talk about advanced malware protection. We call it AMP for short. Uh, that is pretty much been plugged into the entire Cisco portfolio at this point and even beyond, as you'll see here in just one second. But that provides a lot of our threat detection and sandboxing capability. So earlier, I was talking about you know remote users and potentially using their phones or their iPads. Uh, and, and what, what risk does is, is that present um, to the network and to your data? And so Duo is a key part of our overall zero trust solution. And when you consider that many breaches that happen today, they're not, they're, they're, they're really just logging in. Uh, they're, they're getting credentials from phishing campaigns. They're, they're exploiting probably the, the easiest thing they can, and that's our people. So by doing so, they're, a, they're able to get passwords and they're just logging in and doing whatever they want within our network. So you quickly realize that passwords just aren't adequate anymore. You can't rely on that to confirm identity. And as a result, we need to augment that. And so that's where solutions like Duo come into play because we can now also have multi-factor authentication. And Duo is arguably probably the easiest MFA solution to deploy and use. Uh, so if that user does want to use their tablet or their, their iPhone or phone, at least you get to decide the level of access that they have. And if you want to limit it and make sure that uh, they, they get only to the critical applications and data on their corporate owned laptop, you, you can force that and maybe limit access to, to these. Um, and along the way, if you also determine that the state of the device isn't healthy, maybe because the user isn't updating it, or maybe even worse because AMP which is locally on the endpoint, found that there was uh, a malicious event and it could be compromised, we can actually communicate information from AMP to Duo and have Duo then enforce a policy that limits that device's access into certain applications. So you can do uh, application-specific policies and automated blocking. All of that is part of the Duo offer. So just like connectivity, just like security, just keep in mind that Identity is foundational to this overall SASE conversation as well. So I wanted to take a few moments to just quickly call out a few features that I think are worth mentioning. So I already mentioned it earlier about DNS layer security. You know, that amounts to close to 200 billion DNS requests 
every single day. And that gives us a tremendous amount of intelligence to mine from, gives us a deep understanding of the overall attacker infrastructure. And that was a large piece for why we even acquired DNS uh, was their threat intelligence and how they've identified where all of these command and control infrastructures really lived. So that's a huge piece of uh, the overall offering. And as I mentioned before, not only is it effective, but it's very, very simple and easy to deploy. There's really nothing simpler than just changing your DNS settings, right? And to, to do redirection like that. And even better, the addresses that we give you are based in any cast addressing. So no longer do you have the headache of having to manage you know, all the addresses of all of our data centers around the globe. No, we just give you two addresses and we do all the intelligence to quickly map you to the nearest data center to your location. So that makes deployment that much easier. But for those of you that haven't used Umbrella already for DNS layer security, the, the concept is really simple. Um, if you make a request of a site and it's safe or the policy allows it, uh, we'll go ahead and deliver back the IP address to that location or that site. But if the destination comes back as malicious or if it violates policy, then instead of sending back the IP address, we just deliver back a block page. So again, very, very simple concept, but what's happening in the background to determine uh, how sites are malicious, there, there's actually a whole lot to that. And it's unfortunate we don't have the time to really dive into the, the modeling and the machine learning but uh, please reach out to me or your security specialist, and, and we're happy to arrange a call where we can dive even deeper into any one of these individual components. The Web Security Gateway is there to act as a proxy in the cloud if that's the level of inspection that you need. So this is going to bring to bear um, application visibility as well. So you get to see the apps that your users are using. You get to develop policies around that. The Secure Web Gateway also has malware protection, sandboxing capability and it also supports TLS decryption. Uh, the Cloud Delivered Firewall is your stateful firewall, layer seven visibility. Here's what I like about this though, because it has that layer seven visibility, it really addresses some of the key problems that I've even seen deploying, helping customers deploy in the past. And that is, um, as an example, what if you wanted to limit your users access to just WebEx Teams and you didn't want them using Microsoft Teams or Google Hangouts? Well, with that application visibility, you can define a policy around that. And, and not only can you do that, but if you find out that you have users that are doing SSH on anything but port 22, you can also define policies on that. And probably one of the more relevant ones that, that I had to deal with a lot <laughs> was dealing with things like peer-to-peer -peer applications, which tend to be blind spots for proxies, which only operate on ADN443. So when you get that visibility, not only to the apps, and you get that visibility down to the, the port and protocol level, it's a tremendous amount of control that you get. And so that helps round out this entire solution. Now, as you heard in the earlier session, SecureX is what we use to combine threat intelligence, not only across our own portfolio, but from third parties. And it makes investigations really simple so that you can correlate events and, and see how um, different attacks might have transpired or even entered your network because at no point are these things happening in isolation. When you see a threat event, there's a good chance that your other security devices are seeing artifacts of that campaign as well. And so SecureX is really going to tie all that together for you. Now at the bottom here, you see there's some off network devices in SD-WAN. We're going to focus on SD-WAN in one of my demos. And it's we're going to focus on it from the standpoint, as I mentioned, of making it easier to connect devices. So we can do auto tunnel creation, and that's going to make it so much easier for you to enable your branches. So imagine this scenario that you have maybe a dozen new offices, and, and all you need to do is drop ship a router to that location. The person there unboxes it, and all they need to do is plug in power and a network cable, and that device is going to call home and not only get its router config, but built into that router config is the necessary information for it to automatically establish tunnels into this SASE cloud. So that is uh, what you'll see in the demo here in just one second. In the way of kind of understanding the order of operations, we'll always do DNS level security first. It's very low latency. It's very quick. It's a fast way of getting rid of the things that quite frankly don't need to traverse the entire security stack. And the other thing to keep in mind too, is that 
pretty much anything that is internet enabled or connected relies on DNS. And for that reason, this gives you a broad level of visibility into your network. And there's a reason for why uh, Umbrella is one of the first tools our IR teams deploy when we're helping customers with breaches is because it will give you a tremendous amount of visibility to the calls that are being made out to the internet. And so uh, it's very easy to see any sort of C2 communication, command and control. Um, next, we pass traffic that passes, you know, the, the malware smell test <laughs> and the policy test. We, we send that into the, uh, the cloud delivered firewall where you can apply everything that I mentioned before around app visibility and, and against, you know, the five tuple of source destination IP port protocol. And then finally, if you wanted to scrub it even further, you can then push your ADN 443 traffic into the secure web gateway for full proxy capability. These are my last slides before we get to the actual demos. Uh, I wanna cover just some typical scenarios for SASE and use cases, things that you should keep in mind. And this first one, well, this first two or three are actually around remote workers, but this is a specific persona, like a, a, a task worker. And as you can see here, the thing that makes this unique is that they can do their entire job without a VPN. And that's just the nature of kind of how applications have moved not only to the cloud, but also to SaaS. And so uh, on the left side here, you'll see the core elements that we provide to this user. They, they still have the benefit of AMP threat protection. They'll connect into the cloud via AnyConnect. Um, oh, sorry, no, not this one. I don't know why I should have taken that one out. They, they don't have a VPN, but it's still there. Just keep in mind if they wanted to use AnyConnect as a, an AMP enabler, or if they wanted to use it for, for uh, Umbrella DNS, that's, that, that would still need to be there, but not, not for the VPN. And then you're probably wondering why WebEx is listed. Well, you know, it's a collaboration tool, but as you might imagine, we've gone and integrated AMP everywhere else. Now we're starting to push that into our non-security products, which you'll see in the demo as well. And then Duo, which I mentioned, facilitates a lot of our identity. And so what you see here is that, you know, as the applications and the data are all becoming internet delivered, whether we're talking about SaaS, um, they have all the tools needed to, to make those connections. We protect all of their DNS and their web requests by redirecting that traffic into this cloud where we can apply that inspection. Uh, and even better is if they were to create connections into the Duo cloud, uh, if their application wasn't SaaS-based, what we can do is make available or publish uh, the needed application, web-based applications to them, even without a VPN. And we do that by having them form a connection to Duo, and then we more or less proxy that connection right into that infrastructure, whether it's a, a local instance or something that you have in Azure or AWS, wherever it lives. But that's what the Duo DAG or uh, network access, um, it's the act, um, <clears throat> application gateway. That's what that facilitates. So other things to talk about on this slide before we move on to the other one is that, you know, this overall SASE architecture is one that allows you to deliver a unified and consistent policy regardless of where that user actually is. Uh, it's cloud delivered. It's one that can scale on demand, as you can imagine, because it's cloud-based. It's very easy as your needs change. If you need it to scale up, it's very easy for that to happen. And because everything is so deeply integrated, not only is threat response possible in an automated way, but it can be done very, very quickly. So I spend a lot of time on this slide because it's foundational. As we move on to this one, a lot of it stays the same. And really what changes here is that for a knowledge worker, sometimes they actually do need a fairly constant connection into the corporate infrastructure. So that's what this aims to demonstrate or highlight is that we give them a software-based VPN like any connect and this is designed in a split tunnel configuration so that anything that they need that is hosted in the data center, they have access to via that tunnel, but the split tunnel configuration will send all else directly to the cloud. And so that's what allows them to leverage um, all of the controls that you see here under umbrella. The last and final remote worker scenario is one that's actually hardware based. So for the power user, we have all the same core elements, but we introduce things like a Meraki MX or Z3 
or the Viptel 1100. And by having this there, uh, not only can it do all the things like create tunnels automatically, but it's in a sense always on that the VPN connection is always there. Like in my house here, I always have the same SSID and Wi-Fi that we broadcast in all of our corporate offices. I have that in my own home. So it makes it very, very simple for me to connect. Um, I have my collaboration endpoint. I'm talking on my DX right now, or whether it's a DX or the WebEx Desk Pro, you, you, you can really have the same exact experience as you would if you were just sitting in the office. But the real other takeaway here, which we'll get to in a moment, is the zero touch provisioning. You'll see that in the demo. Uh, this is the same as the last slide. Uh, and, and by the way, this is the last slide and we'll do demo. But this does pretty much the same thing as the power user. It's hardware based, but instead of it being for a user, it represents an entire branch. It operates in much the same way. The difference here is that because it's a branch, you might want it to connect to the broader SD-WAN network and fabric so that it has access to other SD-WAN enabled locations. All right. So with that, how are we doing on time? Okay, I think we're good. Let's go ahead and switch over to some demonstrations that I have for you. All right. So I mentioned earlier that these demonstrations are going to be more from the perspective of the user. It's going to give us an opportunity to really drill down and talk about what's happening behind the scenes and why it's important. So in this scenario, we have two users represented by these two desktops. We have Charles, who has that tealish color. Uh, desktop, and then I also have Anita, whose desktop is the purple one. And so we're going to highlight uh, the controls that we have now incorporated into WebEx Teams. We'll talk about AnyConnect VPN and how we protect that with Duo multi-factor authentication. And then we'll also finally wrap up this demonstration with a discussion around umbrella DNS protection. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this started. So these are the two desktops. So the day begins with Charles needing to share some sales projections. And so he's going to go ahead and open up Teams, and he's going to try to give Anita a call, who's going to be busy at the moment. So she's not going to be able to answer. She's actually going to decline and politely say, I can't talk right now. So we'll let her go ahead and respond. And as you can imagine, this is a critical tool, even in the office, being able to communicate with coworkers, it still remains just as important. That doesn't change just because we're working from home and elsewhere, but you, you have this available on your desktop for not only your meetings, but your voice and, and also general uh, messaging and video. So she replies back, sorry, can't talk right now. And he lets her know, that's fine. I just really wanted to share the sales projections with you. So he's gonna go ahead and drop in this XLS, which she's gonna be too busy to really look at right now. So we're gonna come back to that. Just hold that thought on that XLS file. We'll talk a little bit about that. But for now she's you know busy and she needs to get some stuff done and she needs to access some things in, on the internet. So she fires up her webpage and the first thing she notices when she tries to get to the corporate portal, portal is that it's just gonna hourglass, right? Or, or beach ball and spin. And this happens to Many of us every single day, we forget that, oh, yeah, that's right. For this, we actually need to have the VPN turned on. So for her, she's a knowledge worker. She needs to turn on her VPN. So that's what she's going to do now. And she gets prompted to, to sign in. This is probably nothing new to any of us. We do this every single day. But before she hits send, she has to go grab her phone. Because she knows that in a moment, she's going to have to approve a multi-factor authentication prompt. So she hits that button and on her phone, what she'll see is that there's going to be a duo push notification, which she can just push on and right here, she can approve or deny. Okay, let's pause for a second here. There are many ways you can actually approve a duo push notification. Now I personally use the same thing that you see happening here and I allow the app on my mobile phone to present this uh, option to me. I like it because I also then get that same exact prompt on my watch. And so I never even touch my phone. I don't have to reach for it. I just wait for the little bing on my, on my watch and I approve it right here. But just keep in mind, if you don't have an iPhone or you, you can easily approve this 
a, a multiple a variety of multiple other ways whether you're using still a code like a six digit number we, we could have easily have chose passcode as the option that you see right there in in the background um we could have leveraged a yubi key that's plugged into the usb drive here or so all we need to do is touch on that and it uses uh biometrics to recognize that i am who i say i am and it will go ahead and authorize that in and, and we've even enhanced uh, the support so that if you're using a Mac device, you can use Touch ID that's on, on the, the MacBooks so that you can just touch that. And that will approve this prompt and request. But this right here, this process that you see is a huge piece of making sure that you don't get breached. Because like I said, phishing campaigns are being run every single day. And you almost have to assume that somebody in your organization is going to click on a link open an attachment and get tricked into giving away their credentials. So passwords are no longer good enough. Just make sure that if you aren't already having something like this in play, that you, you go ahead and enable it. So as soon as I've done that, you can quickly see that the connection does then continue. And the VPN connection allows her then to open up her browser and gain access to that corporate portal so that she can go ahead and do all the things that she needed to do that loads. Maybe she needs to look at some records, uh, some HR documents, internal resource stuff, so or or financial documents, whatever she needs. But you can see that's that's basically the VPN and protecting the VPN. After she does her work, she remembers, hey, there was those sales projections. Let's let's get to those. So she now has time to look at that. So she's going to go ahead and download that. And when she tries, she sees that she gets this malware detected in the file prompt. So this is the other really cool bit about how we are pushing our threat intelligence and capabilities beyond just our security products. And they're being integrated deeply into things like WebEx Teams. So what's happening is as soon as Charles uploaded the file, that file gets analyzed by all of our scanners. And we can come to a determination on whether or not it's malicious. And if it is, then what we will do is prevent anybody from downloading it. So you can protect uh, Anita here. And so she's going to be a good corporate citizen and she's going to go ahead and reply back, hey, maybe you shouldn't be sharing this document anymore because it's been flagged as malicious. You should probably get rid of it. I don't know where you got it, but uh, that's, that's the malware protection that's now been integrated into WebEx Teams. The last and final thing that I'll show you is, you know, general web surfing. Every single day, we might be loading different sites, and that site might be malicious. So we mentioned this in the when we talked about DNS security. What happens if we were to load something that would be malicious? So instead of actually delivering back the IP address, if it's something that can cause damage or harm the network, we deliver back a block page, and this is what that block page looks like. This is all customizable. You can um, change that as you need. But that's Umbrella in a nutshell and the overall experience from the user perspective. Now let's shift gears and let's talk about what this all looks like from the administrator's perspective and what they actually had to do to enable some of this infrastructure. So what you're gonna see in this demonstration is me jumping between two UIs. We're gonna talk about the umbrella cloud and what we do there around policy and defining a policy. And we're also gonna look at vManage for Viptela and where we actually configure the templates needed that get pushed into the various routers. This is, this is the, the part where we talk about the auto creation of tunnels. So to begin this demonstration, I first need to go to my umbrella portal and create some API keys. So that's what you see me doing here. And in the umbrella portal under admin, you'll see there's a, a variety of different API keys that can be used, some for even secure X. But in this case, we're gonna use the one specific to management. And it allows us to generate the needed key and secret and org ID that then ties this router to this specific account in the portal. So I'm creating the API key here. And so, there's three bits of information that I mentioned that will show here. There's the key and the secret. And what I need to do is make sure I copy this away somewhere because in a moment, as soon as I leave the screen, it's never gonna show again. So save your stuff <laughs> because if you ever lose this, you're gonna have to recreate the API key and that can have an impact, right? Um, I'll show you an easier way to do this here in a minute. 
so you don't have to worry about any of this copy pasting. But now that we've closed that out, uh, now we just need the third component, which you can see up in the URL, and that's the org ID. That's that number that you see there. So I'll go ahead and I'll copy this. And these are the three bits of information that I'm going to need to allow inbound API access into my account. The next thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, vManage. We're going to switch gears. We're going to have to create a couple templates, and we're going to modify the template that, that, that routers download for their configuration. So I'm logging into the vManage portal, and now we'll do the creation of the two templates. Uh, the two are basically one for the credentials that allow the API calls into Umbrella, and then the other one are the actual IPsec tunnel configurations that we need to uh, that we need to define. So here's the creation of the very very first template. Uh, along this menu option, you'll see there's a variety of different devices. So I'm going to scroll down and look for the one that I need. But you can see there's a, a broad number of of devices there that we can apply. Uh, different configurations too. I'm going to pick this V Edge Cloud option. And when I scroll down on the right side, we're looking for uh, the credentials, SIG credentials. And this is where we're going to use those three bits of information that I just pulled from the Umbrella portal. I'm going to give it a friendly name at the very top here. And then I'm just going to copy and paste those three pieces of information into the key, the secret, as well as the org ID. Now, all of this copying and pasting is, you know, it's, it's easy, <laughs> but there's an even easier way to do it. What you see on the screen uh, is a get keys button. We've made this even simpler for folks that are leveraging smart licensing already. And if you're using uh, DNA, DNA Premier licensing, all you need to do is click that get keys and it's going to automatically be done for you in the background. So all this information you don't have to do manually, but this is basically the first template. That's all we need to do. And this template is going to be used to grant the router, as I mentioned, access via the API calls into the cloud. Now let's talk about the second template. The second template is going to be specific to the VPN IPsec tunnel configuration. Not too complex. This time I'm not going to actually scroll. I'm just going to search for it, make it a little bit easier. First time I wanted to show you kind of the list of different devices that are, are there. Uh, on the right side here, I will pull up the option for VPN SIG. And this is where we'll start defining the tunnel configuration. We give it a friendly name first. And then what you'll see here in a minute is that I will create the tunnel config. The first one is going to be um, for the primary IPsec tunnel. So any device, I mentioned earlier that not only is the connection get generated automatically to the cloud, but we do so in a way that's redundant so that if there should ever be a problem with the primary IPsec connection to the cloud, there's always a backup. So that's what you see me doing here, quite simply defining a name and an interface and just defining that as the primary. And I'm going to repeat that entire process one more time for the secondary, and this time choosing secondary. Pretty straightforward, nothing too hard here. And then I scroll down at the very, very bottom, and I'm going to define uh, which one should be my primary active versus the backup. So those are the two tunnels that I want to configure the routers to have into our SASE cloud. And this is the uh, HA part right here. We're halfway there. That, that's pretty much, you know, I think some of the hardest parts. <laughs> if you can do that, you know, you'll be in good shape. Uh, next, we just need to modify the template that the actual routers inherit their config from. And you see that happening here. So we're going to go ahead and modify the template so that it inherits the configuration. And this is as simple as just calling out the two templates. I want to define from a transport and management VPN level the IP set configuration. And then I'm going to scroll down. And I'm going to also put in the credentials so that when it makes that call, it, it can actually get access into that infrastructure. 
for expediency here, I'm just going to go ahead and hit next. So that you can see there's the credential for uh, the SIG access for the API. And we're going to go ahead and push that. So what you see happening now, if you wanted to, this shows you the configuration for time constraints. I'm not going to let this load, but if we wanted to scroll through it, you'd, you'd actually see uh, things like the keys, things like the IPsec configuration, all of that got pushed into the configuration. And so as soon as I say configure devices, all of the devices, whether it's one or a hundred or a thousand, they are all now getting this configuration. And so now all we're left to do is go ahead and double check here if the tunnels have been formed to our portal in Umbrella. And right there, you can see the tunnels are active. And so those are both available for the single device. You have the primary and the secondary tunnel. And then I will show you one last thing uh, where we jump back over to the vManage portal and you can see kind of get visibility to that same thing from its perspective. So if I look at the network and I, I drill down into this particular router uh, and look at the interfaces, you can see that the IPsec tunnels are up and up. So I'm gonna scroll down here in just one second and you can see there's listed there. It's kind of a little bit hard to read maybe, but you'll see IPsec1, IPsec2, and let me get rid of a column so we can see it a little bit better, but there you go. IPsec1 and 2, the tunnels are up and up. So this is what allows you to just drop ship routers directly to the locations and have it call home for its configuration and in the process, go ahead and get its needed configuration. Um, in the time remaining, I know we have about three minutes left. Are there any questions, Ryan, that we can address live that haven't been answered? If you have a specific question, go ahead and raise your hand um, in the uh, in that function, and we can go ahead and unmute you if you'd like to ask your question live. If there's anybody out there, go ahead and do that now. Okay. If it comes in, great, but I'll continue on just for another minute. Uh, I'll show you the, the firewall policy here uh, in in Umbrella. It's it's your the fire tuple. As, as you can see here, I'm creating a policy for blocking flows that are based on destination port 444. So that's all possible. And this is what that looks like. And all I need to do is define this for block and make sure I enable logging. And then as you can see on the left side there, we won't have time to get into it, but there's also the web policies where if I wanted to define a policy for blocking certain categories or the application of Facebook, or if I wanna turn on things like H, uh, TLS decryption, that that's all possible from this portal as well. And with that, I'll, I'll pause and uh, see if there's any other questions. Paul, could you clarify something for us? Uh, earlier you created, uh, you sh in your demo you showed creating the Umbrella API keys so the, the router could connect to the Umbrella cloud, but then you went and made the VPN tunnel to also connect to the cloud. Could you highlight the differences there for us, please? Yeah, sure thing. So. Keep in mind that these routers, for them to even form tunnels into this ASCII cloud, they need to know which account, first and foremost, they need to bind to. So that's where the org ID comes into play. And they also need to have the right key and, and information or else, you know, what prevents anybody from just saying, well, you know, I want to connect to the, uh, the SASE cloud. So that's what the, the, the template for the credentials does. And what makes that different from the other template is that we still need to incorporate into the router policy the needed configuration for saying, hey, there needs to be two IPsec tunnels. It's going to go to the SASE cloud. So that's what the, that configuration did. It looked really simplistic because what you didn't see is that we had to define some sort of path or an address. And that's really the beauty of the deep integration that we have between Viptela and the SASE cloud is that you just say, no, I want the primary and I want the secondary and I want you to figure all of that out. So it looked really simple, but there's a lot of stuff happening under the hood that makes all of that possible and makes your life a lot easier. That helps. That, that's why I was confused is because it looked way too simple. You didn't have to define yes. any, any uh, ACLs or route maps or anything like that. It just kind of did it for you, which was, which was a little con confusing for me because I don't expect it to be that easy. Now, now, just keep in mind, what you saw here was us embedding the needed SASE components into an existing template. 
So there was still a whole host of other, you know, uh, configurations around things like the, the, the subnets, the default routes, all of that still needs to be configured into the template that was kind of outside the scope for this demonstration. I just wanted to show you how you can incorporate the actual SASE configuration into an existing template. Got it. Thank you. No problem. All right, Paul. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, great second session. Thank you. Excellent work.